Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth. Remembering great ones is easy to do. What if after no days you spent their whole lives? Lost after footballs and catching sack flies. They're guys, remember that guy. Remember that guy, remember that guy, remember that guy, remember that guy. They're just going to remember some guys now. It is Mystic Dan, down toward the inside, with the lead into the final 16th. Forever Young, Sierra Leone is coming. These three coming down to the wire. Who's it going to be? Oh, it's a photo at the Derby. Oh, it's a photo. Was it Mystic Dan or was it Remember That Guy, the show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players, past and present. Hey there, folks. It's me, number one Preakness supporter, one of your hosts, James. It's the most important one. It's the one that has the highest stakes. We all know who we're rooting for when the Preakness yes. comes around. By far the best of the big three. Diaz back with you once again. I'm not the best of the big three, but we have a very special guest. He might be the chosen one. Please introduce yourself. I'm not going to say Jalen Brunson because that'll just make you upset. So I'm going to just well, push. The, I, I, I guess the, the Villanova big three, I guess, is what you can uh, say. Ah, there we go. There we go. The, no, the Nova Knicks. Although I, I think I love Josh Hart more because of just how Josh Hart <laughs> plays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling Reggie Miller, hey, you hear they're saying fuck you, right? Just that was, I just wanted to make sure that you, Reggie Miller, heard that this crowd is telling you to go fuck yourself. It's incredible because the entire game, let's take a step back. Reggie Miller's infamous choke pit like sign, they lost that series. Reggie Miller was 7 and 27 all time in Madison Square Garden. They beat the Knicks in the playoffs in one series, the Knicks won every other one. It's just the the eight points in nine seconds gave him an outsized measure of importance over the Knicks. It's the Iverson step over Tyron Lue, and we don't have to talk about the rest of the series. Yeah, exactly. It's proof that PR matters, man. Solely because of this, they fly Reggie out to cover the game, even though it goes against their own like existing rules on who's covering what games. He makes like an Instagram video or a Twitter video beforehand talking about how he owns the city. Everything. What the fuck are you talking about? During the game, all he's doing is talking about how much the Knicks suck and how much he loves the Pacers. Jalen Brunson is out for an entire quarter. They do not mention him being injured at all during the quarter because Reggie Miller is just talking about, oh, coming back from 15 down, they're doing so good. This is the true Pacers basketball. Ignoring, again, the fact that it happened while Jalen Brunson wasn't on the court. And then we end it with the Knicks having five healthy players beating the Pacers because Rick Carlisle is a terrible coach. And Josh Hart going over to make sure that Reggie Miller knows they're saying fuck you, Reggie. Hey, Rick Carlisle, if you can find 78 things to complain about in two games, I don't know. You could maybe use a challenge. You could use a challenge on one of those 78 things, Rick Carlisle. You could use a challenge. You could also keep in the only person in the entire NBA that has proven to guard Jalen Brunson well. And he's a six-foot coach's son, gym rat, first one in, last one out, doer of kind things of guy that I cannot say on this daughter. podcast, but I do know them of secondhand knowledge, and I'll just say he's a pretty cool guy, TJ McConnell. DJ McConnell was so good in the first two games that Knicks fans are already clamoring to get him on the Knicks next year. Him and Alex Caruso, and they think the Knicks would be the worst team to ever play against ever, which would probably be correct. And I love that the, the Yankees, this is coming out in Knicks fans now. There's like future Nick, future Nick. And, and Carlisle, two games in a row, benches McConnell for almost the entire fourth. After McConnell leads the second unit on a run to either tie the game or take the lead. Because that's what happened. McConnell got into a one-point game with like seven and a half left in the fourth and did not see the court again after that bucket. And Nembhard was just there getting punked by Jalen Brunson for the last seven minutes. Everybody could see it. He, he can't defend him. But because Nembhard can apparently take threes which he didn't do in the fourth quarter, 
Rick Carlisle refused to make the switch. So, you know, I understand his complaints about the first game. The kickball not being reviewable, that sucks. I, I get it. But you can't come out and say, actually, there were twice as many wrong calls against us in the second game when you had a double-digit lead against a team with no players and then took out your best defender and watched the other guy get cooked and made no changes. The thing, too, is, like, you might not remember this, Xavier, but the defining moment of TJ McConnell's Sixers career was he hit a game-winning buzzer beater fadeaway over Carmelo and Porzingis. So it's in his DNA. He owns the Knicks. He always has. He always will. He owns the Knicks 10 times more than Reggie Miller does. Oh, I, I remember Worldwide Wob put out a, uh, a tweet the other day. It was watching TJ McConnell hit that game winner. At least we don't have to see this guy for another 10 years. And then flash forward 10 years to now. It's like, damn. Yeah, at least Rick Carlisle is not Brett Brown and won't have TJ McConnell in at end of game situations. So you don't have to worry about him hitting another buzzer beater. Yeah, good good start to that series for the Knicks. And man, how crushing is it for me personally as a Temple Al Philadelphia 76ers fan to see these guys dominate the city for all these years. And then maybe you have the consolation of, oh, well, the Sixers should know about them. The Sixers have all these second rounders. They can draft all of them. The Sixers had multiple chances to draft all of these players. And instead, they have knocked the Sixers out. And now they're making Xavier happy. I guess that's a good consolation for me, at least. I'm glad Xavier's happy. Xavier's happy about the the Knicks, the Rangers. Is there anything outside of Madison Square Garden making memories for you right now? Yes, actually. So I do want to give a quick shout out to the Rangers because I've told it to you two in our personal chats. Even if the Knicks do win this year's the Pacers, I expect them to lose to the Celtics pretty quickly because the Celtics are just a better team. And the Knicks are going to end up with like three active players by the end of this series. The Rangers, though, from, as I said before, the weird position of being President's Trophy winners and being massive underdogs in the second round to a team they beat three out of the four times they played in the regular season, to then winning the first two games, including a double overtime Vincent Trocek winner, to the point where the Hurricanes have now benched their goalie for game three tonight. That one feels pretty good. Because the Rangers, I think they're the best team in the NHL. I don't say that lightly, but the fact is their special teams are better than anybody else, both power play and penalty kill. The Hurricanes had, what, the number one power play in the league this year, and they're 0 for 10 against the Rangers, and the Rangers are 4 for 9 against them. When Igor is on a 29-game streak of not letting in more than three goals, as long as we score a couple, they're going to win. And I... I think we're heading towards a Vancouver Rangers final, James. I, I think it's going to happen. Yo, I'm so thrilled they won a playoff series. Hey, don't bring the Canucks into anything beyond that, dude. They won again. Yeah, I know. It was great. I would love for them to not be down 4-1. Like, don't bring the Canucks into this. They're good. They're good, dude. All right. Well, if we see Canucks Rangers again in a couple weeks, then we can talk more about it. But the non-New York thing I wanted to talk about was Bayer Leverkusen. Because we have not talked about them this season, and what they're doing right now is absolutely insane. For those who don't know, Bayer Leverkusen is a German soccer team in the Bundesliga. They have never won the Bundesliga title. They're 120 years old, and they've been ever-present in the league, but they, they always lose. This year, they have not lost a single game. And not only have they not lost a single game in the league... They haven't lost a single game in the Cup, and they haven't lost a single game in European competition. At this current moment, Bayer Leverkusen, through 32 games in the Bundesliga, there are only two left, have won 26 games, drawn six, lost zero. They're in the DFB Pokal final, and they're in the Europa League final. And today, in the Europa League semifinals against Roma from Italy, They had another just insane moment where they're down 2 0, and then they just never feel like they're out of it. In the 82nd minute, they score on the funniest own goal ever, where the Roma goalie just misses it, and it bounces off the face of a Roma defender and into his own net with nobody within like 15 yards of him. 
He just wasn't expecting it to get to him. And then in the 97th minute, they score to equalize and go through on aggregate. I have seen them score in the last minute of stoppage time six or seven different times this year to keep that unbeaten streak going, which is absolutely insane. It, it, they feel like God's most favored team right now because they just can't lose. I'm really hoping they can get through these last four games because if they get a treble while going unbeaten in all three competitions, that might be the greatest sporting achievement ever, especially because in the Bundesliga this year, Dortmund, who are fifth, are in the Champions League final against Real Madrid, and Bayern Munich, who they beat to this, who they beat to the title, just lost by crazy circumstances to Real Madrid in the last minute of stoppage time yesterday in the semifinals. Otherwise, it would have been two German teams in the Champions League final, and then a third going unbeaten through three different competitions, including beating those two every time. So big props to Xabi Alonso and Bayer Leverkusen, because what they're doing is absolutely insane. And our sincerest apologies for ruining those final four games by mentioning this. I mean, I... It could happen, but to be fair, their DFB Pokal final is against a second tier team that happened to just upset its way to the final. I think they're favored by like three or four goals in that. If we, I think if we had a German Atalanta. listener right now, Xavier, they'd be throttling you. <laughs> <laughs> it depends Ooh, which wait. team they're pulling for, though. That's so, fair. Uh, I, I got. I have a list. Hold on, real quick. Bayer Leverkusen's late goals this season: ninety fourth minute versus Bayern. 94th minute versus Karabag, 94th minute versus Augsburg, 91st minute versus Leipzig, 91st minute versus Stuttgart, 92nd minute versus Karabag, 93rd and 97th minute versus Karabag because they beat them on stoppage time goals three different times this year. 97th versus Dortmund, 97th versus Stuttgart, and 97th versus Roma. That's absolutely insane to be in double-digit stoppage time goals to keep an unbeaten streak alive. That is wild. Speaking of streaks, there's there's one that's come to an end now because, Diaz, I don't think we can talk about the Sixers this week. Absent of that, what is it that's uh, making memories for you right now? Well, I want to kind of build off of what Xavier was just talking about, referencing the crazy game yesterday, Bayern versus Real. Bayern takes the lead in uh, Bernabeu. It looks like they're going to go through. And... Real Madrid does what, what they always do. They get the miraculous late goal. They somehow persevere. But a lot of times in the past, it's been a star player. And I need to talk about the guy who is the toast of Madrid right now. The man known by simply one name, Hossolo. An incredible journey that he's had to this moment. He's 34 years old. His career essentially started with Real Madrid. He played for Celta Vigo, but at the age of 19, Real Madrid noticed him. They bought him. He mostly played for their B team, scored a lot of goals for the B team, got the B team promoted up from the third division into the second division of the uh, Spanish football system. Only played in two games for Real Madrid. Scored in both of them, but there was just no spot for him with the main roster. So he began his football odyssey all throughout Europe. He plays with Celta Vigo. He plays with Hoffenheim in Germany. Goes on loan to Frankfurt. Plays for Hanover 96. Comes to England to play for Stoke City. Gets loaned out to Deportivo back in Spain. Comes and plays for the Geordies for two years. He was a Newcastle lad. We had a chant for him. We said, Hasselu, Hasselu, he might score one, he might score two. He only scored six across two seasons in Newcastle. Goes back to Spain, he plays with Alaves, he plays with Espanyol, and he is not even officially with Real Madrid. He's only there on loan for this season because he has had this late resurgence. Real Madrid said, why not? We don't want the full thing, but we'll take you on a one-year loan. He scored nine goals across 32 games for him, but none bigger than those two to put them through into the Champions League final against Dortmund. The back where it all started for him, as true a boomerang guy as we could have ever talked about. Hasselu is incredible. And it's not just that he's doing it for Madrid. He's also finally getting noticed for Spain internationally. 
prior to this year, he had played for the Spain like U20, U17 teams. The only international soccer he played on a senior team was for Galicia, which is an autonomous region in the northwest of Spain. He played international football, not even for his own country, but now he's finally getting call-ups to play for Spain. He scored a late winner for them in the semifinal of the Nations League to beat Italy. It is incredible that he is in the twilight of his career. 34 is like about as old as it gets for a soccer player. You might have two or three more years after that. Most likely, your best days are well behind you at this point. But Hasselu proving that age is just a number and putting Real Madrid through into the final. I know a lot of people are sick of it. Real Madrid does this every year. They can't keep getting away with it. I have no choice but to root for Hasselu. I got to keep pulling for my guy. I mean, he can get away with it. He's here for the first time. Exactly. Exactly. No, it's it's um, just a new, a new twist on everybody's least favorite song. But to me, all of a sudden, that song's a little catchy. I kind of <laughs> like it. Well, we led this off with a discussion of the Triple Crown, the Derby, Preakness, Belmont Stakes. But there is another Triple Crown that if I can bend y'all's ear for a moment, I want to discuss. Because uh, I've mentioned Tadej Gacher here before. He is the 25-year-old Slovenian wunderkind of cycling. We're getting into the meat of the cycling season now because we're getting into the Grand Tours. There are three of them. And so, like, Grand Tour Triple Crown in cycling is winning in order. The Giro d'Italia, which is like the Italian one. The Vuelta de España, the Spanish Grand Tour. And then the Tour de France. So, not an easy thing to do, but Tadej at this point has won the Tour twice. He won the Young Classification there four times. And while this was like a tall task, an outside chance initially, a, a possibility, that became a lot easier like a month ago when <laughs> there was basically in the Tour of Basque Country, stage four, this massive crash where several people like broke ribs and fractured collarbones and it just knocked out a huge portion of the contenders for the cycling season including Jonas Vingegor who has won the last two Tour de France's and is the main like GC general classification rival of our boy Poggy so now that they're all out this is all of a sudden become a much easier thing for Tadej to accomplish uh, I was hoping you were going to say Stephen Bradbury was going to show up and right. just somehow have have coasted to the win. Well, the th- Tadej was not even in this race because he's like fully just said, I am focusing on the Grand Tours this year, those three. And so he's basically warming up for the Tour de France with the Hero d'Italia. He's crushing it. Like it's, it will be shocking if he doesn't win. And so the universe, not having a rival, had to introduce some other obstacles into the world. He got the Maglia Rosa, the pink jersey, which is like the yellow jersey equivalent for the Tour de France here in the Hero d'Italia, worn by the leader. And for stage three, they're going to be going through Torino. Uh, It is the 75th anniversary of the Torino football team plane crash, wiped out a, a huge like golden generation of Italian football players. Very tragic. And as an homage to Torino, when they're going to be having this stage go through it, in addition to the pink jersey, Tadej was given a skin suit of a lovely, uh, the official color is Grenade. It's kind of like a a maroon, red, purple mix. And he wore this for the one day. And the next day was back to black shorts. And we wondered why. It turns out that UCI, the governing cycling body, uh, was so upset about the skin suit that was provided to Poggy by the race promoters. Uh, They were so upset about like the way that that coloration could theoretically be interpreted as another team that they threatened Tadej with total disqualification from the event if he did not switch back the next day. And like there is an incredibly minor difference between shorts and skin suit in there. So like this doesn't actually matter that much, but it's good to know that uh, incredibly stupid uniform stuff is not exclusive to America. And then with that shot, one quick chaser related uniform stuff, the PWHL will be exclusively having Bauer make their jerseys, not Fanatics, get fucked. Shout out to the PWHL for that. And to our boy Poggy, still in the lead at this point, expected to make some big time in the GC over the weekend by the time you all hear this. That's what's making memories for me right now. You did remind me, though, of um, the Perfect Game article in The Athletic, more Fanatic shittiness. Mm -hmm. If anyone who hasn't seen it, I would totally recommend reading it. Essentially, a massive youth organization that has a monopoly on scouting for youth and high school baseball players 
has been working with fanatics to essentially get these teenagers to sign away their likeness in perpetuity and just sell trading cards and memorabilia and they'll never get a dime of it for their entire lives. Very, very, very scummy behavior. Not surprising by Fanatics and Perfect Game, but it's, it's a great, great expose. Well, once again, to harken back to that Kentucky Derby call at the beginning and the idea of a photo finish, we have before done other categories. I think I've been the one to, to bring them up a couple times. Record scratch, right place, wrong time, that have definitely danced around this topic of people being in kind of like iconic moments, but with Wheaties last week, and with that victory, with the selection of category, I decided to just go ahead and take guys featured in famous photographs. So to begin with, if a picture is indeed worth a thousand words, let's talk about the picture. I am sure you two have seen it. I'm sure many people, probably everyone listening to this has seen it. And there's a couple different angles of it. It takes place at the Rose Bowl in 1999. Uh, you cannot make out too much of the stadium. It is at pitch level. So all you can really see are the rings of uh, different advertisements for like Coca-Cola and McDonald's, a lot of red. Occasionally you can see teammates, but the one thing that you can see is a player who just scored the game-winning penalty shot and celebrated with the oldest celebration in soccer, which is to whip one's jersey off and wave it around in the air. It's a basic guttural thing. This person has then dropped to their knees, letting out a guttural victory scream. But what is different about this celebration versus the many, many, many that have come before it, is that under this jersey, now on display, is the sports bra that is going to scandalize a nation. And it is being worn by my guy this week, Brandy Chastain. Hell you know I yeah, love Brandy, Brandy Chastain. Chastain. Yeah, and no, I didn't almost... think this was going to be a tough pitch for the two of y'all. I've had Brandy Chastain as my number two option on four or five different categories. So I'm glad that you are finally pulling the trigger where I could not. This image of her like really brought about me wanting to do this category. But let's talk about the person in the image, not necessarily behind the image. We'll get to the person behind the image later on. But the person in the image, Brandy Denise Chastain, was born in San Jose, California, July 21st, 1968. Not quite nice. But growing up there in the Bay Area, this is not one of those stories where like, oh, this kid's just good at every sport. And eventually they pick one from a young age, from the age of eight, Brandy goes straight to soccer and never really veers in any other direction. At that time, when she was joining in, it's estimated there are only about 12,000 girls nationwide that were playing organized soccer here in the mid to late 70s. By the time she gets to junior high, it's still like there is no girls team. So she plays for the boys team while there after a successful tryout. But at this time, she is part of a wave of people, uh, of women and girls specifically, that are coming into sport post-Title IX in 1972, and there is a growing infrastructure for the soccer that she's doing. Moreover, she is inspired to represent her country. That's specifically something she really wants to do with sport ever since seeing the Miracle on Ice. That's like a formative experience for her. She wants to do that same kind of moment of national glory. So she sticks with soccer. She goes to the big Catholic sports school in the area, Archbishop Mitty. Some other alumni from here. We got Aaron Gordon, Mitch Hanniger, Kerry Walsh Jennings. There's a wide array, including Brandy Chastain. And they're in the California Central Coast Section Athletic League. The Monarchs with Chastain, three-peat in the mid-80s. This is all enough for her to get recruited to the then Pac-10 powerhouse, Cal. R.I.P. Well, hey, you know what? They got the rights. It's not dead yet. It's only mostly dead. Well, Cal isn't isn't part of True. any. True. Yes. No. It is no longer a legend, but the Pac-10, 12, whatever, lives on in our hearts. At this time, the college game is getting kind of that slightly delayed boost in talent from what the younger leagues in in middle and high school had been reaping at this time of an influx of women who had sport available to them growing up. Even this though is not enough to keep Brandy Chastain from standing out as a freshman. Cal's one of the country's best teams. They go 15-2-1. She, as a forward, scores 15 goals, named an All-American, named Freshman Player of the Year, and then gets double ACL surgery in the offseason. Baby, both knees have to get surgically repaired. This literally knocks her out for two years and ends her career with the Cal Golden Bears. Yeah, I mean, just curious. make her the $6 million man at that point. Just replace everything with springs and titanium. We have the technology. We can rebuild her. 
I mean, whatever they did, obviously they did a pretty good job for us to get to that picture eventually. But like, I wonder, like, do you think they were playing on grass or were they playing on shitty ass field turf? Would have to imagine Cal home games are probably grass. They just seem like they've got enough money, but I'd be shocked if like everyone in in the Pac-10 at that point was operating with grass. No, it it was definitely field turf. Uh, Just speaking as someone who is very familiar with the early days of women's soccer, every pitch, every training pitch, every standard pitch was field turf until the 2010s, really. That's when they first started trying to transition them away. Even if they had the money, like a university like Cal did, they would not allocate the money to maintain a field for women's sports. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just based off of my knowledge of U.S. soccer and how they treated women's sports at that time, I don't. I I would highly doubt that it was anything other than field turf. Okay. Based on my knowledge of America dragging its feet to support women's sports, I would also say you're probably right. And just basic public health efforts. Also something that we're famously pretty slow about. So Chastain goes to a different program after this. Her college career is not done. She transfers to Santa Clara University. This is a Jesuit school, so she's going back to the Catholic roots. And I think this pays off because they make the NCAA College Cups Final Four for the first time ever in her first two seasons, in both of them, pretty much fully fueled by her. She is still afforded at this point. 22 goals in that second year leads the nation. Uh, it earns her the Honda Award. We've mentioned that before, awarded to best women in the different sports in college. It does also earn her a spot around this time with the U.S. national team. And along with the sport as a whole, they have really been coming into their own at this time. The coach is Anson Dorrance. He is a once in future UNC legend. He's been playing younger players like Mia Hamm for the past couple of years against the wishes of higher ups that want like the college players at the time dominating the the playtime. But this is now starting to pay off and gel as those younger players get up to that age. They had played in a 1988 FIFA tournament that was kind of like a proof of concept for the Women's World Cup. Coming up here in 1991, it is officially the first FIFA World Championship for women's football for the M&M's Cup. Shout out M&M's. Didn't know that they were the sponsors on the first one of those. And the U.S. qualifies at another first. By the way, they qualified the very first CONCACAF for the women. So I want to zoom in on that first match at CONCACAF real quick. Eighth minute, Mia Hamm scores. Tenth minute, Michelle Anna Lars scores. The 25th minute, she also scores after an April Heinrichs goal in the 21st minute. She gets another one in the 36th after a Julie Foodie goal in the 28th. Foudy. 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 My apologies. This is my own bad handwriting at this point. <laughs> um, anyway, it's 6 nothing when Brandy is called in as a substitute. And then Brandy Chastain scores in the 40th minute. And then she scores in the 43rd minute. And then she scores in the 47th minute. And then she scores in the 66th minute. And then she scores in the 74th minute. Karen Jennings adds one more for the 12-0 win, but in her tournament debut, she scores five goals, and the U.S. wins in CONCACAF combined between their different games, 49 to nothing. I mean, that just makes me think of, like, the, the gap. When, when people first learned about Erling Holland, because he was in, like, an under-17 tournament, and he scored, I think, 10 goals against Honduras in the under-17 World Cup for Norway. It's like, yeah, it's just... One team is clearly... Much, much better, better. Than, the, than everyone else. So that earns them their spot in the 91 World Cup. It's much of the same in the group. They go 3-0 with an 11-2 goal differential. Uh, they got a 7-0 quarterfinal win against Taiwan. They got a 5-2 win against Germany. In the finals, they face off against Norway. A 2-1 win does win them the M&M's Cup. And they're in China. It's viewed by 65,000 people in the stands, which is pretty great. It is not televised in the United States despite them having done all of this for glory. They were only getting paid $10 a day during this. They are still pretty much anonymous when they arrive back. Chastain kind of like keeping busy for a while between big glamorous tournaments for the national team. In 93, she spends a year in a Japanese pro league. In her only year, she wins the MVP. She's the only Gaijin named to the all uh, 11, but mostly this is just to keep her busy until we get back to the U.S. women's national team. In 1995, the quest is to repeat. They have not gotten a lot of resources in between World Cups. In fact, they were put on hiatus twice to focus resources on the men's team at this time. But they're back 
However, between those hiatuses and an increase in parity as we're going forward here, they have the unthinkable, a tie in the group stage. And then eventually in the semifinals, they lose. In the third place championship, they also lose. And it's just, it, it's not a great time. Not a great showing. This is also under a new coach. I'm going to ask you guys, Tony DiCiccio? Tony DiCiccio? That one I don't know. Okay. Well, this is the coach gotcha. of the time. D-I-C-I-C-C-O. I'm going to call him Tony DiCiccio. The, the, the Chico, maybe. The Chico? There we go. The Chico sounds fine. Tony DiCiccio has taken over from Dorrance in 94. Despite the fact that he has now failed in like his first major test there, he can't dwell on this for too long because there's another first that they need to compete in. Here in 1996, they need to compete in Atlanta at the first ever Olympic Games to feature women's soccer. Brandy had actually been left off that 95 World Cup roster, but Chico does bring her back for the Atlanta Games. And she had in that like previous era kind of been brought in as a substitute forward often. Now she is largely just playing defense. So she's not on the score sheet as much, but in game one of this tournament against Denmark in the 37th minute, she assists on a Tisha Venturini goal. This is the first ever Olympic women's goal. She does get the assist on that. So again, remains largely off the score sheet the rest of the tournament as the U.S. win in their group twice, tie once. They advanced to face Norway in the semifinals. At this point, Chastain suffering a knee injury again, but bounces back to not only finish that game in the semifinals, but then get a finals win over China 2-1. She plays every minute of the tournament for the gold medal winning U.S. women's national team. And with this, they turn to the next big showcase, which is the 99 Women's World Cup. And this one is going to be hosted in the States. So they're getting a little bit ambitious. They schedule a bunch of the games in football stadiums just to do what we talk about very often here. Make it possible for people to come see this sporting event because people tend to like sports and will show up for many of these if it is good, high quality sport. So we've got games at Soldier Field, Foxborough, Giant Stadium. We got college games like Stanford. Uh, We even then have the site of the final, Pasadena's Rose Bowl. U.S. advanced out of a pretty weak group, Nigeria, Denmark, and North Korea. I didn't know that North Korea was involved in the 1999 Women's World Cup, but there they are. Finishing third in that group, for what it's worth. Uh, North Korea has been in multiple men's and women's World Cups like I in guess the past just, 20-something years. I mean, there was there was a whole thing, what was it, 2010, when North Korea scored against Brazil and it was like a, a, a massive like shock. I think they still lost like five one or six one, but the North Cor- but like North Korea reported it internally as like they beat Brazil one nothing and had yeah. that guy as a like a massive Kim- celebrity. And Kim Jong Un had an assist on that, didn't you see? <laughs> it was a glorious victory. <laughs> I just, yeah, I guess I just assumed that like they weren't allowed to play nice with everybody else, but there they are getting whooped. Through the group stage, they get into the quarterfinals. Chastain gets her first World Cup goal. It is unfortunately an own goal. Puts Germany up 1-0. It is 2-1 Germany to start the second here in Landover, by the way, Washington football team territory. Four minutes later, this time Chastain gets the correct goal in the 49th minute to tie it up before Joy Fawcett scores the winner 17 minutes later. So U.S. wins 3-2. Go across the country to Stanford. In the semifinal, they go up 1-0, five minutes themselves this time. They add a penalty in the 80th minute. That is enough to beat Brazil 2-0 and advance to the final. A rematch of the 96 Olympics against China. July 10th, we've just wrapped up the third place championship. Brazil has beaten Norway. Perhaps it is portentous that it was a 0-0 game that went to penalties. A world record crowd is on hand here. 90,185 full capacity for the Rose Bowl. It is a world record that is for any women's sporting event at that time for this rematch of both the Olympics and that year's Algarve Cup, which is a prestigious Portuguese women's cup tournament that has existed for a very long time. And that year it had been a 2-1 China win in which Brandy Chastain missed a penalty shot. There are not a lot of good chances throughout regulation. This is a, a like defensive masterclass, and if you like that kind of soccer, it's a great game to watch. And if you like a lot of exciting breaks with like shots on goal and stuff like that, it's pretty fucking boring. Um, <laughs> it is, but I, it's a fun highlight game to watch. I'm sure watching 90 minutes of it was a little bit tougher. Um, 
But anyway, not a lot of good chances. China's best chance comes in extra time. At one point, they get just a little bit past the wall. Defenders, Fan Yunjie gets a header off. Christine Lilly, fellow defender, just comes in out of nowhere to block it. And so we remain tied 0-0 as we hit 120 minutes. And we get sent to penalties. At this point, there is one person amongst these 90,185 that we will zoom in on. A Sports Illustrated photographer named Robert Beck. And this is his first ever women's soccer game. He was sent here not to get any of the glamorous shots. It's his first ever game. He was sent and credentialed to go to the upper bowl and just get like lots of crowd shots, lots of shots of the field from up there to kind of like convey the scope of the stadium. And he's gotten a lot of those because there's been extra time. And now as he's getting towards the end here, he's done a lot of other stuff in the Rose Bowl. He knows like the inner workings of the stadium. He decides to try and see if he can just get down to the field, you know, with the credentials that he does have and just the know-how that he has. And so he's sneaking down. While he's sneaking down to get on the field, Chastain hears from DeChico that she has been slid up in the order for penalties. She's no longer sixth as she was initially penciled in to be. She's going to be fifth now. Almost guaranteed a shot against the team that denied her a penalty on a pretty big stage months ago. Through two rounds, China's going first every round. All four have converted. We get to round three and the U.S. goalkeeper, Brianna Scurry, saves the shot by Liu Ying. And after the already extra time hero, Lily, converts, the U.S. is officially up 3-2 with two rounds to go. Zhang Ying converts. Mia Ham, Sun Wen, they also convert. So I mean stepping up to the line with the score knotted 4-4 in the fifth round with the potential winning ball at her foot. It's none other than Brandy Chastain. You go back and watch this. There is no stutter step. There is no fancy footwork. She takes a couple steps. Puts it in the upper right-hand corner, past the diving hand of goalkeeper Gao Yong, and Brainy Chastain in the United States win their second ever World Cup on penalties. She immediately whips the jersey off, first turning to her team, and then facing back away towards the goal, just falling to her knees. And it's this moment where Robert Beck, who was able to successfully sneak down onto the field, snaps a shot with the teammates out of focus running into the background. This runs as the Sports Illustrated cover with the headline just simply entitled, Yes! Exclamation point. The one that I admit I was more familiar, there is a second angle just off to the left of Brandy Chastain. This is the one that features a little bit more of the Coca-Cola. And you can't see the team at all. You can just kind of make out her as a solitary figure. The slightest hints of an audience in the background. This very quickly started to be sold as a poster reproduction. So between the SI cover and this poster, this image is everywhere. And some people absolutely hate it. A couple reasons. One is the very dumb reason of like a sports bra scandalizing children. To those people, I don't know, man. Smoke a joint. Like do anything fun for once in your life. You suck. Like there's nothing else to say to you. To the maybe even dumber people who think that this is some kind of like pre-planned Nike psyop because she does admittedly have a small logo on the sports bra that she's wearing. It's so tiny. It's so fucking tiny. It would be terrible advertising if that was intentional advertising. Like if it was giant and emblazoned across her, maybe you get the conspiracy theory going. Chastain has said like over and over, it was just spontaneous. Like, duh. Yeah. Thankfully, the majority response to it is positive. For one, while that is kind of cynical, this does lead to an overnight explosion in sports bra sales. This product had only existed since like 1977. This was not a long established apparel thing. And so a lot of people just didn't know about it. And this is like a watershed moment in women's sports, not on par with like Title IX in 1972, but it's a really big deal when hundreds of thousands of women all of a sudden who are like coming up playing sports here in a country that is becoming more welcoming to it at least just learn that sports bras exist it's great so this is an image that largely now is seen as an expression of i think a dream of equality that we have in sports that this is just equal to the exact same reaction that guys have been doing for years just like look at the strength of this athlete's body that was just able to achieve something momentous and look at them express what that achievement means to them in a way that is 
primal and from deep within. And it's, uh, it is great. It is the crowning moment of Brandy Chastain's career couple other quick hits to round out that career she does appear in one more world cup in 2003 uh she also makes both the 2000 and the 2004 olympics with the u.s women's national team there in athens in 2004 they get a gold which means she finishes career with two world cups and two olympic gold medals which is none too shabby after a few years with a couple like nascent attempts at professional leagues here in the U.S., there is the WUSA, the Women's United Soccer Association, and the WPS, Women's Professional Soccer, both flame out pretty quickly, despite her involvement and the involvement of many others. So she does officially call it a career. And maybe Brandy Chastain is too good to be a guy. Let's just throw that out there here as I finish up. Like, this is a very accomplished career. It is a decorated trophy case. But for what it's worth, I think one of the, the biggest things about her potential guy is the recognition of this moment because uh, we should say that for a brief moment in time, this sports brawl looked like it was going to be lost to time. It was donated to a fledgling sports museum in New Jersey in 2009. And then within months, that museum goes out of business. And they don't know where in like their collection it ends up for a while. She does eventually get it back. It's framed now. It's hung on her wall. In her own words, it is not only in a place of honor, it is like the trophy, the thing that she sees every day walking through her house. It is an image that lingers with her. It's an image that lingers with the country. And it has a place of honor there in her home. I hope that we can find a place of honor here in the hall. That is my guy this week, Brandy Chastain. Do love Brandy Chastain. And I will say, I don't think that she is too good to guy, just in my opinion, Based off of the people that were on that team, like right. it was, she it was Mia overshadowed, Hamm. Overshadowed, yeah, overshadowed by Mia Hamm. Even Brianna Scurry, uh, I feel like overshadowed I, I a, will admit, a little bit. I assumed it was Mia Hamm, like when I saw this the first time as a kid. I was just like, oh, it's someone that won a U.S. Women's World Cup. Must be Mia Hamm. I was an idiot. No, Brandy Chastain, iconic for that photo. With the sport I chose, basketball. It's tough to think of like an iconic photo. That isn't somebody who's like very clearly too good to guy, right? Like some of the most iconic pictures in basketball history. You have the Jerry West logo picture. You have Wilt with the 100 poster. You have Michael Jordan, whether it's the dunk contest when he's fully extended from the foul line or hitting the shot over Byron Russell. With all these photos, these are guys that are too good to guy. But then I thought about that. Michael Jordan, Byron Russell. There's the other person. That's in the iconic photo. And so that kind of gave me the angle that I wanted to work with here. The, the Frederick Weiss of it, so to speak. Exactly. The, the, the Frederick Weiss of it. And the person who I want to talk about today does come from a French speaking area, but not French himself. I want to talk about the picture. First off, the most infamous photo of the Miami Heat run is Dwayne Wade arms extended out as LeBron is thrown down a dunk behind him. It is often replicated. It's been redone with all of your favorite characters and all of your favorite athletes have probably done some variation of trying to recreate that photo. Everybody wants to be LeBron. Everybody wants to be D-Wade. Who you don't want to be is the defender framed just between them, but clearly enough that you can see his face and his number. He's looking up almost more in awe than in disappointment. I want to talk about the guy who's not just the person in that picture. He is the man behind the Cameroonian revolution in basketball. He's a builder off the court. He's a lockdown defender on it. And before coming to America, he was an African prince. That's not even a joke. He is Luke Richard and Bahamute. This was the other person other than Brandy Chastain I would have thought of doing. Just to let you know, much as you were both excited about Brandy Chastain, I am excited about Luke and Bahamute. <laughs> I owe a lot to Luke Mbamute, and I think anybody who is a Sixers fan or a Raptors fan or currently Pacers fan, your Pascal Siakam fan, you owe a lot to Luke Richard Mbamute, who was born September 9th, 1986 in Yaoundé, Cameroon. His father, Camille, had been elected chief of their local village. That's how Luke got the title of prince. Prince doesn't necessarily mean royalty in Cameroon. It just means... You come from an esteemed family. 
his father, in addition to being that local chief, he worked at, as the general manager of Cameroon's National Employment Fund, working closely with the president of Cameroon. So this is a family that is pretty well off. But before his days working in government, Camille was a pro athlete himself. He played two years of professional soccer in Cameroon before his father basically told him, look, sports is for people who don't have real dreams. Withering assessment of our pastime. Right. It just very dismissive. Why do you want to play this silly little game? You need to focus on your career. So he moves on from playing soccer. But Camille, when he was raising Luke, remembered that and said, I don't want to be like that. I want to empower my son if he wants to be an athlete. And so growing up, like any young kid in Cameroon, there's not really basketball courts. Basketball is not really a thing. Soccer is a thing. Football. So he grows up as a football player. Are you guys frozen? No, I'm listening intently. Oh, you guys, you guys are saying very intently. Well, this is the man who inspires Joel Embiid. So, you know, oh, we got to give him that credit. And I, I, I want to give him the respect he deserves. So he grows up as a soccer player. And when he takes his path to the practice field, it takes him past the basketball court. And most times that he walks past, there's kids playing there. He doesn't really know what this game is or how it works. He's kind of just picking things up, looking at it. One day he goes past and there's nobody there. So he figures, well, let me try throwing this. I'll, I'm going to shoot my soccer ball. We're going to see what happens. There's not a net on the rim because that's kind of just the state of the courts there. But it does go straight through. It would be nothing but net if there was a net there. And he says from that moment, he was hooked. Stuff that you Imagine just can't he make missed up. that first shot. He he, he misses that right. first shot. I was like, ah, I'll head off to the pitch now. Right, yeah. Imagine he just completely airballs and he's like, ah, I think I'm going to keep going to the football pitch. But no, he makes that first shot. And in things that you can't make up, under the tutelage of coach Guy Murio, it's actually pronounced Guy because it is French Cameroonian, but Guy Murio notices Luke Mba Mute, brings him under his wing. And in short order, he's developed into a very promising prospect. When he's 16, he gets an invite to the Basketball Without Borders camp in Johannesburg, which is the camp that is basically for the African continent at large. Anybody with any basketball talent goes there. He impresses a lot at the Basketball Without Borders camp. And so under the advisement of the first Cameroonian to ever play Division I basketball, Joe Tomo, he would move to America and he would enroll at Montverde Academy. Plays there for four years uh, under head coach Kevin Sutton and had a lot of offers to go to NCAA. Could have almost had his pick, but he decides to go from the East Coast, Florida, Montverde to the West Coast, UCLA to become a Bruin. As a freshman, albeit an older one at the age of 19, Mba Mute had an instant impact for UCLA. He led the team in rebounding as they would go on to win the Pac-10, and he quickly became a fan favorite for the UCLA student section. And it's not the Kevin Love team, is it? It's not quite. It's not the Kevin Love team yet. Okay. Uh, what it is, it's the it is the Luke Richard and Mba Mute team. It's also the Alfred Aboya team, a fellow freshman coming over from Cameroon, and with these two stars leading the way. The UCLA student section had their own take on the Cameroon crazies. They became the Cameroon crazies. They would wear the colors of Cameroon. They would come out decked out in signs. There were shirts that made that said Mba Mute kicks booty. He is an absolute fan favorite playing for this UCLA team. And on the back of winning the Pac-10, they enter the NCAA tournament as a three seed. And in the Sweet 16, they meet Gonzaga. Yes, this is that game. We all remember an iconic image in the history of college basketball. Adam Morrison, tears in his eyes, head in his jersey, as he collapses to the court and realizes his college career has just been ripped away from him. And it's not even him, which is the most devastating part of it. It's his own teammates turning the ball over and fucking up that lead to UCLA having this dramatic comeback to win in the Sweet 16. No, the most devastating part is realizing that he's going to be on Charlotte soon and his career will be over. 
Doesn't get much worse than Charlotte, but in that moment, so devastating for Adam Morrison. But what you don't remember, after Jordan Farmar gets the steal, it's Luke Mba Mute who hits the layup to give UCLA the lead as Gonzaga then panics back down to the other end, not getting the ball to Adam Morrison. It is Luke Richard Mba Mute who pokes the ball out from behind, dives on top of it, forces the jump ball, and all but seals Gonzaga's fate as UCLA goes on to win that game by two. He makes Adam Morrison cry. You can say it. He makes Adam Morrison cry, and this is now our iconic image within iconic photo within this story. This is another watershed moment of which Luke Richard and Bahamute is a significant part. From there, they go on to winning the Elite Eight. They go on to the Final Four. They beat LSU in the Final Four to advance to the National Championship. But if you remember our Corey Brewer episode, this is the 06 National Championship, the first of those back-to-back that the Florida Gators would have as they lose in 06. For the 06-07 season, they would again go to the Final Four. This time, they meet Florida in that Final Four matchup. Again, they lose. And we go into a pretty big summer for Luke Richard and Bob Mute because this is going to be the first year that he will represent Cameroon internationally as they go on to play in Afro Basket 2007. With Luke Richard and Bob Mute as the best player on the team, the leading scorer, they go a perfect 3-0 and in group play. Go straight into the knockout rounds. They beat Ivory Coast in the quarterfinals. They beat Egypt in the semifinal. And in the final, they meet Angola. You might remember 92 U.S. team. Their first game was against Angola. That's the famous Charles Barkley quote. Angola wasn't playing USA. They were the dominant team of Africa around this time. And Angola does win Afro Basket 2007. So Cameroon has to settle for the silver. And I'll spoil... The future a little bit. This would be the only time that Luke Mba Mute would play for the Cameroonian national team. The infrastructure is severely lacking for this national team. So much so that their practices are outdoors. They do not have an indoor gym to have their practices at. So fucked. Just fucked. as as he becomes a more you know pronounced prospect, it's not worth it to him to train in these conditions. Even if it was worth it to him, team's not necessarily going to allow it. So just that one brief run for the international team, and he's able to take Cameroon all the way to the silver medal. For his junior year, he again would lead UCLA to the Final Four. In so doing, he became the first Bruin to do it since the days of Wooden in 72-74. There was a trio of Bruins to do it back then. You had Greg Lee. You had Jamal Wilkes, and you also had Bill Walton. So it's been quite some time since somebody's been able to lead this team to these heights. We are now at the time of freshman Kevin Love. You have Russell Westbrook. You have Darren Collison. But when you go to the Final Four, you're going against Derrick Rose and Memphis, and so you lose. I wonder how they feel knowing that that Memphis team was then vacated everything. They're like, we could have beat Kansas. We could have won that if we weren't cheated by Derrick Rose and his fake SAT scores. Right. And that's like the one kind of vacating where I at least think it's a little bit legitimate. Like, not to say that the SAT or the ACT are legitimate, but like. He wasn't a legitimate college student. Yeah, you gotta take the test. There need to be some academic standards to play college basketball. I think as a baseline, it, we can all agree Mario on that. Ch- Mario Chalmers made sure that uh, that didn't end up becoming an issue. Iconic. Iconic. And, you know, we're going to get to Mario Chalmers' future NBA team in a little bit. But, you know, coming off of that, this is junior year, he could go back for four Final Fours in four years. But he instead decides to declare for the NBA draft. Goes 37th overall to the Milwaukee Bucks. And just as he very quickly endeared himself to the UCLA fans, he quickly becomes a fan favorite in Milwaukee. Just nine games into his rookie year, he steals the starting power forward job from Charlie Villanueva. And he becomes a mainstay in the Milwaukee starting lineup. After his second season, we're now entering the summer of 2010. 
And that is an incredibly huge one in the history of basketball. We all remember LeBron took his talents to South Beach, teamed up with fellow free agents Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh to go to the Miami Heat. But he wasn't the only big free agent name that summer. You also had Mari Stoudemire going to Xavier and the Knicks. A lot of big things going on in the basketball world in that summer. But away from all of the spotlight going on on these major transactions, Luke Mbamute wanted to make a difference back home in Cameroon. Again, as we mentioned, the basketball infrastructure there is so poor that even the national team did not have a consistent indoor facility to go to to have their practices. So he commits to invest in the infrastructure in Cameroon, pays for a whole bunch of indoor gyms to go up. And he also establishes a skills camp available to all kids in Cameroon. Any kid that can get to the camp, there's no cost. And at stake are five guaranteed spots in the Basketball Without Borders camp in Johannesburg. So whereas previously, you just need the hope to get somebody's attention if you're a Cameroonian growing up playing basketball, you now have five guaranteed spots if you go to this camp and you show out. He establishes this camp after doing so in the summer, comes back to start his third season with the Milwaukee Bucks, and we are now going to go forward to December 6th, 2010, as the new look Miami Heat come to town to play against the Milwaukee Bucks. The starting lineups that evening. Miami, we already know three obvious ones. You got LeBron. You got D-Wade. You got Chris Bosh. The starting center for the Miami Heat that night was Zydrunas Ogalskis. Really? He came over for one year with LeBron because that was like how much LeBron loved playing with him. He was like, fuck all of these guys, but you're the only one that's worth a shit. Fuck you. Come to fuck Miami. you. You're all right. Like from baseball, like, wake up, bitch. You're my new best friend. Okay, yeah. we're, all, we're all going to Miami. The starting point guard that night for the Miami Heat, one of the earliest inductees of the RTG Hall of Guy, Carlos Arroyo. Ooh, our very first Latin influenced guitar artist into the hall. Not the last, but our first. Exactly. The first. And, you know, also, listen, let's not Puerto Rican. All right. Rest of Puerto Latin America, y'all can catch Puerto up. Puerto Rico legend. The, 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 there are two that we have, and they're both Puerto Rican. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Rest of Latin America, get your game up. We're, we're over here doing it both. But. Dos Nichols. That's your starting lineup for the Heat. For the Bucks, you got Brandon Jennings, John Salmons, you got Larry Sanders, you got Andrew Bogut, and of course we have our boy, Luke Richard and Bob Mutai. Early in the first quarter, the Heat are leading 6-2. Brandon Jennings puts up a three. He misses it. Luke and Bob Mute is about to secure the rebound, but Andrew Bogut knocks it loose. Gets in the hands of D-Wade. D-Wade actually has Carlos Arroyo ahead of him. He can hit him for a nice layup, but he knows behind him is trailing LeBron James. So instead of giving it ahead to Arroyo, he instead leaves it off for LeBron, and Bob Mute is just a step behind, and LeBron rises, and we get that famous snapshot, LeBron with his arm fully cocked back about to slam it home, D-Wade with the are you not entertained look on his face, and in between them, look Richard and Bob Mute looking up saying, God damn it. He's like in wonder as he sees it, but in exactly, a very yeah, like, exasperated wonder. It's like, like, what am I supposed to do about this shit? Yeah, like that's yes. This is this is unreal. I can't believe this. You did shout out the photographer for the Brandy Chastain photo, so it was Maury Gash who took the photo. He is the only AP photographer in the entire state of Wisconsin. So it's a good thing he didn't call out sick that night, or we never would have had this picture. For that game, Bob Mute goes 2 of 4 from the field, scores 4 points to go 3 boards and an assist in 23 minutes as the Heat beat the Bucks 89 to 79, which is crazy to think basketball games were still that low scoring just that recently. Finishes out that season with Milwaukee, he would play 5 total seasons for the Bucks before they would send him to Sacramento in exchange for two future first round picks. Plays just nine games there before he gets traded to Minnesota for Derek Williams. In the following offseason, he is involved in a pretty big trade. It is 
his former UCLA teammate, Kevin Love, going from Minnesota to Cleveland. This is the Kevin Love-Andrew Wiggins trade. He's not going to Cleveland, though. Instead, he's being rerouted in this three-team deal, which also involved the Philadelphia 76ers. The Sixers sending out Thad Young. They get back Luke Richard and Bob Mute, as well as a first-round pick. But what they most importantly get is a mentor for their newest addition via the draft. And the first player to come up through that camp that Luke Richard and Bob Mute established in Cameroon to make it into the NBA won Joel Hans Embiid. Not to take away from this beautiful moment in Cameroonian history, do you think that LeBron in his GM hat specifically rerouted Mbamute in this trade away from Cleveland because he remembered that play? He was like, look, no disrespect, but I yammed on him one time. We can't be messing with that. I mean, I would not put it past LeBron. I think if there's anybody in the history of the NBA, the one thing like on the GOAT debate, LeBron has more of a say over the way the NBA works than Michael Jordan did, I think. Sure. I think sure. he's leveraged his power in more of a way. So if there's anybody that could have had that to kind of like, hey, send him to Philadelphia, I could see it being him. But, you know, this is also a very shrewd move by Sam Hinkie. He knows we have this incredible talent coming in. We know Joel Embiid is just going to miss the one season for his broken foot. Certainly couldn't miss two seasons in a row for no. a broken foot. So we bring in Luke Richard and Bob Mute to be this mentor and to keep him on the straight and narrow. And that's kind of his main job as he's with the Sixers. He does start a majority of the games, but him being here to be a mentor to Joel Embiid is what they're most interested in. He has some modest success on the court. The one thing that he kind of worked on this year is showing that he can be a volume three-point shooter. It's the one thing the Sixers allowed him, you know, playing in this environment where winning doesn't necessarily matter. We don't care if Luke Richard and Bob Mute is getting up more shots. If it's going to help his career, absolutely. So shoots 31% from three on an increase in attempts. Not great, but good enough that with his defensive reputation, he's still able to, you know, craft out a role for himself. And initially... It's the Sacramento Kings that are looking to reestablish a culture. They want to bring him back after they just had him for nine games. But after they screwed him over, kind of acquiring him and then trading him so quickly the first time, you should have known that there was something up. The Kings tried to void his contract by saying that he failed their physical. Bob Mute thinks this is complete nonsense. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I played a whole season last year. I don't have any new injuries. I'm fine. You signed me. Let me play basketball. There's a whole dispute, but where it ultimately gets settled is he takes a physical to play in a game over that summer, which he passes. And this is the first NBA Africa game. This is the 2015 NBA Africa game. It is the first game of a North American pro sports league to be played on the continent, not just first NBA game. And they played in Johannesburg. I just want to go through these rosters because you have Team Africa versus Team World. Team Africa, obviously, you have Luke Mbaa Mute. You have a young Giannis Antetokounmpo, Nick Batum, Bismack Biombo, Boris Diaw, Gorgi Jane, Festus Azili. Serge Ibaka was out for injury, unfortunately. And at center, you got Nazi Muhammad. But you also got the Kembe Mutombo and Hakeem Olajuwon. Just like... Yeah, we could probably beat whoever the other side's going to send out. They both played like two, three minutes at the start of the game. It was very much just the let them have this moment in Africa. This is when the NBA gave an all-star spot to Dirk and Dwayne Wade in their final season. Exactly. This is 100% the vibe. And, you know, and they get that incredible reception. But for Team World, it's a little bit of an interesting mix because you have Chris Paul. You have the Gasol brothers, Mark and Powell. You got Nick Vucevic. And then you kind of just have a collection of mid-American players that don't have anything better to do. Bradley Beal, okay, noteworthy. But you got Trey Berth. You got Kenneth Fareed, Jeff Green, uh, Evan Turner's playing in this game. And then you also have Marcus Smart. Goodness. We're not sending our best. Hey, Hey, don't hate on the manimal. Kenneth Fareed being on that team... I, I did. I'm hating on Evan Turner. 
20, uh, I want to say, I think it was 2010 or maybe 2014. He played for a U.S. national team at FIBA and they won gold. So like, you know, Kenneth Fareed and current Cangrejero de Santorce, Kenneth Fareed. So far be it from me to besmirch that name. Obviously, this game was largely a celebratory occasion. Team Africa led by 16 going into the fourth, but a 39-19 to spurt in the fourth quarter by Team World gave them the 101-97 victory. Uh, they, they choked. They held it the whole time. Very uh, unfortunate. But for Luka Mbamute, obviously, the two main things from this game, have this incredible occasion in Africa, have the first NBA game in Africa, and also... Prove that your body works and can play in a basketball game because (laughs) like this was more intense than an all-star game, but less intense than a regular game. I guess I would say the players took it seriously enough. It was was a preseason game. Preseason is fair, but he proves his health. And on the back of that, he signs with the LA Clippers and he spends two years there as the fifth starter in those iconic Clippers starting lineups where you have Chris Paul, J.J. Redick, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, and that fifth man sliding in for two years is Luke Mbamute. Two years there, two disappointing playoff runs. They lose in six to the Blazers in the first round, and then they lose in seven to the Jazz. After that, Luke Mbamute becomes a free agent, signs with Houston, and one notable game while there, they played Denver. They win 123-93. to 93. In that game, Luka Mbamute is a plus 57, which was the highest in 20 years in the NBA. Now, I don't know if that's when they started tracking plus minus, if it's just within the last 20 years. Regardless, it had been a long time since an NBA player had been on the court for more of his team's points and less of his opponent's points than Luka Mbamute. He doesn't start for this Rockets team, but he's still a key member coming off of the bench for that Rockets team that pushes the KD Warriors to seven games. But it was also the same series where they had the 27 consecutive missed three-pointers. Did he miss any of them? I believe he missed two of them. Oh, for 27. Which is insane. Because if they went three for 27 in that stretch, they would have won that game. 3 for 27 is a horrific stretch. And if they go 3 of 27, they win that game. Very sad. And a sad way for Luka Mbamute to kind of go out. He does play two more seasons after this. But the following year, he just played four games with the Clippers. The year after that, he played three more in Houston before he finally hanged them up at the end of a 12-year NBA career. But... With Luka Mbamute, the legacy is not just the minutes played on the court. It is being not perhaps the forefather, but the biggest person establishing this next generation of Cameroonian basketball. And we see it with Joel Embiid winning the MVP last year, being the face of the Sixers franchise. Pascal Siakam, NBA champion, crucial piece of that Raptors team. And a very big part of this Pacers team, wherever they end up this year, as much as Xavier hopes that it is only two more games that they play. Pascal Siakam. It'll help if Siakam can hit any free throws because he was great every time he was not at the free throw line. Something he's got to work on. Something maybe he can get back in the gym with Luka Mbamute on. But, you know, one of the things we always say about guys, they are not just guys for themselves. They... Keep that ladder down. They don't pull it up behind them. And I think what Luka Mbamute is doing for basketball in Cameroon is absolutely massive, helping to continue to grow the game. He is currently working as an agent in Cameroon to help represent the next generation. So recognizing his role, doing everything he can, coming from royalty, but having that dog mentality. He really can do it all. He is Prince Guy, Luke Richard and Bamute. The basketball artist formerly known as Prince Luke and Bamute. I always get so confused because it's like you see Luke and Bamute and you also see Luke Richard and Bamute. And it's like I don't want to disrespect you by not saying the Richard. It's very, well, I, very I have apparently been very disrespectful. 
Well, I don't know if it's disrespectful. Like, is it disrespectful to say the middle name? Is it like, you know, when like you're pissed off at your kid and you say their middle name? Is that what I'm doing? I have no idea. Please let us know what to call you. I know what to call you though. And it's guy. Also coached by guy. I got I'm I'm bring that up again. Coached by Gee. No, the Gee recognized like, guy. That'll I'm sure that carries some weight. It'll carry some weight when we get there, but I'm sure we have a thrilling third picture to discuss, to, to visualize in this audio medium. And I'm sure Xavier has that guy for us. Paint it with your words, X. Well, I have a lot of pictures to talk about. If you know me, you know I like builders. And I also like following in the footsteps of good friend of the show, LJ from Art But Make It Sports, and giving credit to the photographers behind a lot of these iconic photos. So I took this in a little different direction. There is one man who is responsible for some of the most iconic photos that we've ever seen. And I think he deserves recognition for what he's done to get these photos for us. So today I want to talk about Neil Leifer. Neil Leifer, presumably a lifer at this. He is indeed a lifer. And he does also work a bit for Life magazine, so double lifer I in mean, that case. I mean, how could he not? Yeah, how could he not? Neil Leifer was born December 28, 1942 in New York City. And he grew up on the Lower East Side. When he was 13, he was introduced to photography through a local program that offered free classes to children in the neighborhood, and he was immediately hooked. He was also a massive sports fan at that time, mostly the Brooklyn Dodgers, but he loved all sports, and he wanted to combine his passions. So after working odd jobs such as shining shoes, delivering sandwiches, he saves up enough money to buy his own camera. Then it's, I got to find a way to get into these games so I can take some good photos. And what he finds out is that every Sunday during the NFL season, there was a program at a Army Veterans Hospital in the Bronx, because at this point, the New York Giants, the football team played in Yankee Stadium, where you could volunteer to help bring veterans to the game. And if you volunteered to bring their wheelchairs in, you could get a free, a free ticket. At this point, there is no wheelchair accessibility. So where do they park the people with wheelchairs? On the field, at the wall, behind the end zone. So some this of the would've... worst... This is the easiest pitch for a volunteer opportunity to a shitty kid I've ever heard. Like, I'm not that this is a shitty kid, but like, you could get any child to do this. This seems like people will be fighting for these spots. I mean. Yeah, he's a smart kid, and he realizes that most people don't want to do this because the view sucks. But if you're a photographer and you don't mind just standing in the back of the end zone the whole game and only being able to view it when it's close to your side of the field, you can get some really good shots. So he goes every home game, brings an Army veteran to the field, and then just takes a bunch of photos and hones his craft. On his 16th birthday, he gets into the NFL title game between the Giants and the Baltimore Colts. For everyone other than James, this may be a bit dated, but this game has been known as the greatest game ever played. Goddamn right. First ever two-minute drill. Johnny Unitas, baby. Lifer gets a great photo, several great photos, of Johnny Unitas hanging the ball off to Alan Amici for the winning touchdown in overtime. Go Colts! It's a really good photo, and again, he is 16 years old at this point. And he's able to sell these photos to Sports Illustrated, who are like, holy shit, this is really good. So they say, all right, you're 16, but you can do this. We want you to get us more photos. And they just essentially hire him as a freelancer at this point. By the time he's 19... He gets his first Sports Illustrated cover shot, and he's already pretty much the best sports photographer they have. But the sport that leads to you know his big break is also the one that he says that he enjoys photographing the most, which is boxing. 
in an essay uh, he once wrote, he said, quote, the atmosphere of a big time fight, the crowd, the fashion show, all the celebrities is electric. When you're shooting ringside, you feel what the fighters feel hot under the overhead ring lights, squeezed in between the other photographers, all of us pressed up to the apron. When a fighter's against the ropes, you're so close that even with a wide angle lens, you've got to lean back to get the fighters in frame. There is one fight in particular where he gets maybe his first big, like, worldwide breakout photo. And this is Muhammad Ali versus Sonny Liston 2, which I'm sure Diaz knows is the Phantom Punch match. Back when Muhammad Ali was still under the name Cassius Clay, had upset Liston. This is the rematch. He's changed the name to Muhammad Ali at this point. And everyone is pretty sure that Liston just takes a dive because of mob things and other gambling type things where it doesn't look like he's touched them at all. But the photo is fucking incredible. It is one of the greatest photos of all time. Ali is standing over Liston, yelling at him, like screaming. And it, it, it's just perfect. It's and, more so than like any bodybuilding I've ever seen. It's the strongest a human being has ever looked, I think. Full bicep flex. It's like, right? yeah, exactly. It's mid flex. And that's genuine, like, muscle that is used to punch the shit out of people. And, like, I love that picture so much. That is the second sports poster I can remember having. I have the Michael Jordan foul line dunk, and I have this one. It, iconic. Iconic. It's crazy. So he's described taking this photo, and... The only reason that he's in position to take this is because a senior photographer at Sports Illustrated, Herb Sharfman, pulled rank on him. Because, again, Lifer's only 22 at this point, and he pushes him away to claim a spot at the judge's table because he felt that gave him more room to maneuver during the fight. So Lifer gets relegated to the side of the ring where they think the action is least likely to happen. He said, quote, It didn't matter how good Herbie was that day. He was in the wrong seat. If I were directing a movie and I could tell Ali where to knock him down and Sonny where to fall, they're exactly where I'd put them. This photo is iconic. Sports Illustrated, at the end of the 20th century, did a magazine that was just the greatest sports photos of all time. This photo is on the cover. It, 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 it's I, incredible. I will point out, I will point out number two, if I'm not mistaken, on that very list is Brandy Chastain. But it is number two. Another thing that's just important to like realize is how perspective changes. Lifer has said after he first had the Ali Liston shot, there was a contest sponsored by University of Missouri called Pictures of the Year. And Time Inc., Life Magazine, Sports Illustrated all would submit photos for it. They put in the Ali Liston shot, didn't even get an honorable mention. But Perspective changes, time changes, and people, you know, opinions change, and now it's considered one of the greatest of all time. The very next year, Lifer gets another photo that the London Observer called the greatest of all time and is also very high up in that Sports Illustrated list. And this is Muhammad Ali knocking out Cleveland Williams. For this photo, Lifer strings a camera to the rafters of the Houston Astrodome. This is in 1966. Because of the effort he put into this, he considers this his favorite photo that he's ever taken. And for good, for good reason. The composition is incredible. You see Ali back turned to the motionless Williams, arms up, heading back to his corner. Williams on his back, completely knocked out with the ref over his body. And everything is perfect symmetry around the outside of the ring. Well, and not to be too nerdy about it, but like if this is 66, you've got a lot of like really constructivist elements starting to come out in a lot of the, at this point it's being called modern art. Like even nowadays we call this period modern art, uh, the tail end of it as it's starting to switch into contemporary. And there's a lot of this like, 
very geometric construction going into it all. So it's, it's nice to see that he is of the time. He is indeed of the time. And he loved boxing. The other thing that he loved was the Olympics. He said some of his best shots are of the Summer Olympics, but he preferred the Winter Olympics because he just loved ski jumping and bobsled particularly. He thought the photos that you get from that are incredible. But he also loved the experience of taking photos at the Olympics. Quote, it's hard work. The Olympics are a marathon. You go for 17 days, long hours, very little sleep. No real chance to sit down and have anything to eat other than grabbing a hot dog between events. You have the morning events, events in the afternoon, during the day, and then there are events at night. If you're trying to cover as much as you can, which is fun to do, certainly it was a lot of fun when I was much younger. I just enjoyed going. The Olympic events, because there are journal- like photographers from all over the world, he talked about how the competition was so fierce at these. You have hundreds and hundreds of photojournalists jostling for position to try to get the best photos. There are two in particular that are extended Gyniverse guys that I thought are like really up there in his catalog of photos. There was one at the 68 Olympics where he got Tommy Smith, John ah, Carlos, Peter Norman. Our boy Peter Norman. And you know where he's from, right? Crocky. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, James. It, I'm glad you did that. Do you know who this next photo is of? This is the 1976 Olympics in Montreal. Well, we don't have a Romanian soundboard, so I can't do anything <laughs> for Nadia Comaneci, unfortunately. But it is, but it is God indeed damn, Nadia Comaneci. Balance beam, man. Still the only person to repeat in balance beam, if I'm not mistaken. And then this one is for Diaz. This is January 1977. The Philadelphia 76ers against the Denver Nuggets. Diaz, who is that in that photo? I got a prescription, and it was given to me by the doctor. It is indeed Dr. J. The sheer number of incredible photos that Lifer has taken and has you know, given to us, I have a ton more written. I have Secretariat winning the Triple Crown. Uh, first one in 25 years. I have Roberto Clemente in his final season. I have Dick Butkus killing a man. Uh, it, it, it's it's great. And I always want to give credit to the people on the back end of things because we love Dr. J. We love Muhammad Ali. We love Nadia Komenich, Peter Norman. But the photos that stick with us of these athletes are only possible because of the photographers there to capture the moment. And we know that, you know, a picture says a thousand words. Like, things can still be impactful in written form, but it is the photos that really, you know, capture a moment in time. And no one in history has been better at that in sports than Neil Leifer. And... You know, he does, like, in the late 70s, early 80s, decide that he wants to do other things. And so he goes to Time Magazine and takes a lot more, like, um, national event photos. You know, things with presidents, popes, space launches, and things like that. But he always comes back to the Olympics. He's photographed 16 different Olympic games. Fuck. Uh four World Cups, 15 Kentucky Derbies, the first 12 Super Bowls. There's two really good Super Bowl uh, photos. One Super Bowl two where he gets the team carrying off Vince Lombardi. That photo that photo is him. And then he has the Jets huddle in the end zone for Super Bowl three, and a bunch of others. His, his boxing photos are so iconic that he gets inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2014 just for photos. I know it's not technically the the prompt. I know the prompt was subjects of famous photos, but this is one of those things where I really just wanted to make sure we recognize the people behind the camera as much as the people in front of them. Even if you don't vote for Neil Leifer, I wanted to make sure this story was out there so 
our listeners know about the back end and you know how much work goes into that. But yeah, that's an, that's that is my presentation. I think it's an appropriate point to make. I mean, it, like, even without knowing that this is what you're doing, like both Diaz and I, you know, saw fit to acknowledge the people that made this possible because. Yes, well, I I had also gone back to double check the language. It, it was subjects of famous photos, and so I I do think Diaz, you and I need to like between us decide whether it's still eligible. But regardless, I do very much appreciate learning this the, the story of this sports lifer. Look, I mean, far be it from me to say that the people that shoot the guys aren't guys themselves i mean yeah yeah you and your co-workers diaz fuck y'all <laughs> we, we don't do shit we just show other people doing shit no i i i love the neo lifer story i do it's not that neo lifer can't be a guy but if we're to nail down the language honestly if we're to nail down the language of it like it's brandy chastain and we could just go home because luke and bob we say is not <laughs> the subject of the photo so perhaps a more liberal definition is in order. You know, I I, I lean on the side of let's not rule him out. I'm well, we're here. I mean, I, we're talking about it. What's What are yeah. your thoughts on it? I think, like, pure category, like, it's really hard to say that it's not Brandy Chastain. But as a Joel Embiid lover, it's really hard for me to do all this research on Luke and Bob Mute, recognize <laughs> the profound impact he's had on Cameroonian basketball. And uh, I can't not bat for my boy either. Sixers legend, Luke Mbamute. Not a legend for either of the two of us. Interesting that he does have a lot of stops, but never a stop in in, uh, New York or San Antonio. Yeah, really just that L.A., Houston, whatever whatever interstate connects those two. He, He has a lot of time on that, but... Xavier, what are you what are you thinking? I mean, you have gone behind the guys that take the shots, but we do also have here two very featured parts of shots, if not necessarily both the subject. If we were to say that, you know, the guy that technically is not in any of the photos that you showed us is not gonna get voted in, how do you feel about the other two? Yeah, I mean, I'm um, I'm in the same boat as what Dia said earlier, where just going on the literal like definition of the category. It's Brandy Chastain. She's the subject of one of my favorite photos of all time, one of the most iconic photos of all time. Like, if we just want to be strict with that interpretation, then yes, it's Brandy Chastain. And as much as I love Luke Richard Mbamute, I did not remember that he was in that photo, I'll be honest. Which I, I think does, like, obviously the subject of that photo is LeBron and D-Wade. And I want to say... I just want to say about that photo, Carlos Arroyo does make the picture. There's some cropped version that he's not in, <laughs> but in the original full form picture, you can see his sad little face in the bottom left corner thinking, I could have had that layup. How could you be sad watching your teammates do that? Uh, but yeah, Carlos Arroyo also not the subject of the photo. So, I mean, technically well, neither, neither Diaz or I fully followed the prompt we we were in like the spirit of the rules but if we want to be very literal about it it's brandy chastain so i'm i wanted to tell the story of neil lifer i believe neil lifer is a guy deserving to be recognized but i also am fully understanding if we're just like there's one person here who fits the category the best well if i may just to you know buy a little bit more time for hashtag content. Speaking of Lifer, there's one other thing that Robert Beck, the photographer behind Brandy Chastain, has like an iconic image from. And I did want to share that one just because I liked that he, uh, I, I liked his opinion on it as a piece of art. So he was in San Francisco. Oh, actually, I don't know if it was in San Francisco. He was in the stadium when Barry Bonds hit his 756th home run. He captures it was the swing. Him. It was in San Fran. There we go. So he captures the swing there and he captures it just at the moment that another camera flash across the way. God, what it was like to have camera flashes just 20 years ago, filling up the stadium on moments like this. Um, But he captures his camera flash that like perfectly places an asterisk next to Barry Bonds at the moment of this swing. He loves how it turned out. Like that is the print that he kept for that reason. He thought it was the best way to like, 
acknowledge the historical moment of it and still kind of fit in that very uh, right commentary to be in there. We have to acknowledge that, yeah, Barry Bonds do some stuff, man. He also hit 762 home runs. So both things are true. So like Lifer, Beck, a great eye. It is a great eye that composes these images very often in real life. But it is the subject of the photos that we were talking today. So uh, I will now magnanimously allow us to continue with the christening of Brandy Chastain as a guy this week. Well, well he, deserved. Look, you know, James came up with the verbiage. James came up with the guy. James comes up with our inductee this week. And, you know, if you can sense any sarcasm and derision in my voice, it's certainly not intended. I think for any holistically focused 90s kid that grew up as a sports fan, there's two iconic, honestly, three iconic images. From the late 90s, early 2000s that are very formative. You have Michael Jordan hitting the shot over Byron Russell. A little later, we have Kevin Dyson reaching out, trying to get into Dr. that Dr. Kevin end Dyson. Doctor, yes, Dr. 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 Kevin, Kevin Dyson. Dyson. There we go. <laughs> we have Dr. Kevin Dyson reaching out and coming up just one yard short. But sandwiched in between those two, we have Brandy Chastain stepping up just months after having failed in the same spot against China and becoming a hero, not just for women's sports fans in the country, but truly for all sports fans in the country. And such a watershed moment for the U.S. women's national team, such a watershed moment for sports bras, and such a watershed (laughs) moment to have had that photo taken, which will now be enshrined in our hall right next to a plaque of her. Welcome into the Hall of Guy, Brandy Chastain. We like preemptively just we might go out of business at any point, so like don't send us the framed sports brawl, because we will also definitely lose it. If that place did, I, I don't trust us to keep hold of it. But welcome, Brandy Chastain, into the Hall of Guy. It is an honor to to uh honor you, and it is an honor to have been joined by my co-host here and by uh, everyone else that makes this possible, producer Craig. All the coders behind him, our musical director, Don Ham, for that lovely theme music. But most of all, you, dear listener, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Hey, hope, hope you had a good time. If you want to keep the good times rolling, you can do that by finding all of our stuff at bit.ly slash remember that guy, all one word, all lowercase. And that's all I've got this week, my friends. Anything for you? Frank Vogel fired. He's going to be replaced by Mike Budenholzer. And we're going to get so many great photos next year. A Budenholzer's shocked face yep. as the Suns continue to implode. Just losing so much money on a casino game he does not understand. Why are there, like, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, there's, like, five NBA coaches, and there's, like, five NHL coaches. Mm-hmm. Like, Mike Budenholzer, Doc Rivers, Frank Vogel, and then in hockey, it's, like, John Tortorella. Everyone Peter gets right. Everyone gets Vignol. Everyone gets Vignon at some point. Everyone gets Vignon. Like, it's incredible that allegedly there are 30 NBA teams and 32 NHL teams. Mm-hmm. And yet, there's only five coaches in both leagues. It blows my mind. Is there more movement in the coach market or like the goalie market? Because it's two things where I feel like we just keep moving deck chairs around from ship to ship. We need backup coaches. That's what we need. We need an emergency yeah. coach, too. Like, we need, like, if the first two coaches get ejected, some drunk fan gets to come <laughs> down to the bench and just say, eh, fucking Matthews, get out there. Uh, let it be known, all three of us would be honored to be that backup backup coach. For now, though, I will have to settle for having been one of your hosts, James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. I'm Diaz, and remember, it's baseball season. There's nothing like going to the ballpark, get a hot dog, maybe some French guys. Some freedom guys, you mean? Freedom guys. Wow, that sounds disgusting. You It's like some of the days it's the lacrosse championship, some of the days it's Annapolis Blues season two. Back Hell at you. Yeah. Um, season two is always the best season of a show. It's when it really finds its footing. It's going to be so sick. 
we got picked up by like the local DMV sports network as well for those games. So like blues fever, baby might be the summer, but I'm not sad. Catch the blues. Yeah. The blues. Catch the blues is tough. Like don't be sad. Just catch the blues. Right. Catch the blues in nap town. Like that sounds like you're just taking a depressed, like fucking slumber. Uh, what a stupid state. Uh, who would ever live there?